Good morning, men. It is really good to see you all here. It's so good to see so many familiar faces, but also a ton of unfamiliar faces. Welcome. We're really excited to have you here. My name is Sean Regan. Um, I'm a parishioner here at OLGC. I've been coming to uh, the men's prayer breakfast for about eight years now. Um, husband, father of four, and I was just asked to give a brief introduction to who we are. Um, so before we get the conference kicked off, uh, I just want to tell you a little bit about ourselves, but backing up a bit, our conference theme is based on this verse from St. Paul's letter to the Romans. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, what is acceptable and perfect. So as I was reflecting on how I would introduce MPB and tie it into the conference uh, and praying about it, I really uh, got the word community on my mind. So God made us for community. He made us for community with him, but he also made us for community with each other. And since it's such an essential part of who we are, it's, it's really easy to be formed, or as St. Paul says, conformed, to the communities that we involve ourselves in. But St. Saint, Saint Paul reminds us, he says, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of our minds. So we need community that is going to help conform us to our identities as men of Christ. So I ask you, what communities are you allowing to shape you? I can tell you from personal experience that the men's prayer breakfast is exactly the sort of community that's going to help renew your minds and conform us to God rather than the world. Our motto sums it up nicely. We're Catholic men inviting other men to a comfortable, confidential environment where we take responsibility to learn our faith, share our faith, strengthen our faith, and live our faith so that we may grow to be better men, husbands, fathers, uncles, brothers, and followers of Jesus Christ. I've experienced this transformation, and it's through the Holy Spirit primarily, but he asks us to act and uh, be part of the transformation. And I can tell you in my own experience that MPB has played an important role in that formation. So a little bit about who we are and what we do. So we participate in studies together. We mix it up quite a bit. Sometimes it's a book, video series, speaker series, or sometimes just a topic to discuss and have questions about. Then we use our Wednesday morning meetings to pray together and have small group discussions with about six to eight guys. So we keep our small groups together for a year. We switch every July. So it gives you plenty of time to know your brothers at your table and grow close to one another. We share our journeys, our hardships and joys, struggles and triumphs, and we encourage and challenge one another. So the studies in small groups are wonderful and they're critical to our formation. But I think for me, one of the most impactful parts about being a member of MPB is showing up at Wednesday morning at 6 a.m. and seeing 100 to 150 guys there consistently every week. And it's just a fantastic reminder that you're not alone in this journey, that we're called to walk with one another as we follow Jesus. Did I mention that we meet at Wednesday mornings at 6 a.m.? So usually when I'm inviting somebody and I, I drop this little bit of information, I kind of get the deer in the headlights. Uh, you know, people are a little shocked. That, that time is a tough sell. I get it. Um, our lives are busy, though. As a father of four, my life is busy. And I found that this is a perfect time because there is nothing else on my schedule except my pillow. Right, so this is, this is a time that I can make to set aside and grow closer to Jesus. It's a sacrifice, and it's always tough when the alarm goes off, but I never regret it. So please be assured that no matter where you are in your faith journey, there's something here for you. We're not high and mighty better than you Catholics. We're just a bunch of regular Joes. God bless you. Enjoy the conference, and please consider joining us on Wednesdays. Hi everyone, my name is Vince D. Dona. I'm a regular Joe. 
I've been a parishioner at OLGC since roughly 2017 and a member of regular Joe's since 2021. Prior to coming, I bounced around from parish to parish as my geography changed for work and other reasons. I stand here today like many of you, a man who heard of and contemplated joining or just visiting for a few years before joining. I always wanted to join a church ministry to find and build relationships with the Catholic community. I have to give a shout out to Jeff Birch, if you're here, and Jeff Ostrowski for being pleasantly persistent with me. Every time I saw those guys, they would remind me about this opportunity to gather with other Catholic men on Wednesdays at six. I thought, there's no way I'm getting up that early for fellowship. I checked every box of a busy young father of four. I simply didn't think I had the time. But as I remember sailing the seas of finding the right place for us as a family, I needed an anchor. And that's what I found with MPB. I found a compassionate group of men of a wide range of ages and experiences. And I now have the pleasure of getting to know other men and their experiences with their families and their faith. I finally didn't feel out of place. It was absolutely part of God's plan that I would join the table of one of the first members of the group. Shout out to Todd Forfinski. Go find Todd today. I felt his passion and I knew this was the place for me to really grow as a man, as a father, as a brother, as a husband, as a son, and most importantly, a disciple of Christ. I felt, I felt an instant bond to him and these men, a bond that was needed. In this world, it's easy to feel isolated by external forces, and these men helped me form a more personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I've even been told by some of the guys in my group, they wish they had this opportunity at my age. The world may make you feel like there aren't enough men trying to grow and strengthen their faith. And MPB is my weekly reminder that no matter what age or life cycle you may be in, there are others like you who are seeking to grow their faith in Christ. Who believe in the power of prayer and what it may bring. Our practice of prayer allows for us to have a relationship with Christ and we pray. God willing, we can keep this group going and growing. And we welcome folks like yourselves to a comfortable and confidential environment. So come, check us out downstairs and find out more about who we are and what we do. Look for anyone in regular Joe's swag, as Tom likes to say, and we will answer any questions you may have. So come check us out, come see what we're about, join us in fellowship. You won't regret it. And with that, I'd like to welcome Monsignor Todd, who would do our pastoral welcome. Thank you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we are ever grateful to you for your graciousness, for the love, the mercy, the encouragement that you offer to us, and that call to conversion, the call to place ourselves humbly before you, to place ourselves with great confidence that, Lord, your plan is the best, and that despite all the distractions of this world, all of the temptations, all of the many, many ways in which the evil one works to say this is who you are, this is who you should be, Lord, we place ourselves humbly before you again and again and again, asking for your mercy and your love, a love that brings new life, a love that breathes your spirit into us to give us everything we need. And Lord, so as this day unfolds, may our hearts be inflamed with love for you. May our hearts be courageous in being able to respond to your call. 
And may our hearts ultimately reflect you, your goodness, and your mercy. And so, Lord, with great joy and great peace, we place ourselves before you this day, and in your name we pray. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers, it really is a, a great blessing to see all of you, to be able to be with you and offer this prayer and this pastoral welcome. It's a special joy for me to be able to greet Dr. Ralph Martin, uh, Renewal Ministries and Sacred Heart Major Seminary. It was an honor to minister beside him in, for so many years at the seminary to witness his love for the Lord, to witness the way he's really surrendered um, his entire life um, and has given that day in and day out in trying to be an instrument. And what a great instrument, Dr. Martin, that you are for the church and for all of us. I had the great blessing, as I say, of seeing that very intimately for almost 20 years at the seminary. And so his presence here today for us uh, is a great blessing. So I just want to thank you. If we could all thank him for being here. And uh, Dr. Nathan Schleter, I don't think he's here yet. Oh, you are. There, there you are. Wonderful. So what a great blessing to have you here as well and the way in which you lead uh, Hillsdale. And just I have to say what a great shout out the last 24 hours or 48 hours in the final four. Uh, your, your former st player, you know, what, uh, you, hear, you heard Hillsdale everywhere uh, over the uh, ESPN. So it was uh, a great shout out for all of you. But thank you for being here and providing as well your great wisdom and the, the experience that you bring uh, for these men and for our ministry and really as disciples of Jesus to be able to be renewed once again um, by the Lord to say, yes, Lord, it is possible. And so thank you. Let's give a round of applause. Dr. Finally, it is a great blessing to minister with the priests here at the parish, and Father Zaid has been, there you are, Father Zaid has been a great blessing in his first assignment to begin that movement into priesthood, uh, his spiritual fatherhood, and to watch that grow and to continue to move. He's allowing the Lord to let, to be an instrument. So I'm really grateful that uh, he is uh, working so vigorously and with great devotion uh, for MPB, but for so many areas of the parish. So, Father's Aid, thank you so much. And I'm very confident that as the Lord, as we began with the Holy Sacrifice, that we began by allowing the Lord to nourish us. We began by allowing the Lord to dwell right here. We he has, he's in us. We are the recipients of that unmerited grace. So what a blessing. So I'm going to let Father Zaid come to the podium and give an introduction to the conference. Welcome to this conference, um, brothers. I have the distinct honor of introducing our first speaker, whom we all know locally in this community. Dr. Dr. Ralph Marin is the president of Renewal Ministries and the host of the weekly Catholic television program, The Choices We Face. He holds a doctorate in theology and is the director of graduate theology programs in the New Evangelization at Sacred Heart Seminary. And he was also one of my professors. And so let us now warmly welcome to our parish, Dr. Ralph Martin for our first talk. Well, it's kind of special being here today. Can you hear me okay? Uh, Monsignor Todd was my boss at Sacred Heart Seminary. And honestly, he's the best boss I've had at the seminary, right? uh, quite honestly. <clears throat> it was very instrumental in really important decisions, like he suggested I go on for advanced theology degrees, and so I, I moved to Washington, D.C. to get a license in sacred theology at the Dominican House of Studies, and then he said, as long as you have an STL, why don't you go to Rome and get a, a doctorate in theology? <laughs> so the seminary sent me there, and uh, all those things really opened up new doors in my life. And then uh, I did have Father Zaid in class, and I also had Father Anthony, the other associate in class. And you know, sometimes you can tell whether a student's really receiving the word or not, you know? And Father Zaid was right there receiving the word. And I could tell it was really going into him, and so it's really great to see him here serving as a priest. 
I was supposed to be the last speaker today, but a really close friend of mine died, whom I've known for like decades and decades and decades. We were some of the first people in Ann Arbor to help start Word of God Community, Christ the King Parish, uh, Urine Valley Catholic School, and all that kind of thing. So I, I spoke at his wake last night, and I need to be there for the funeral later this morning. So I, I'll have to leave after my talk, but hey, they changed the schedule so I could talk. <clears throat> well, we're, we're living in challenging times. The title of my talk is Living as Catholics in Challenging Times. And I'm not gonna spend too much time convincing you we're living in challenging times because I suspect you know that. But <clears throat> there's some insight that we can get into what's happening. In fact, uh, I got a letter from a priest who, who read this book that I'll be referring to this morning, A Church in Crises Pathways Forward. And sometimes people say, why talk about the troubles? Well, one reason why to talk about the troubles is once we understand the deceptions, once we understand what's, what the lies are, we're able to identify them and we're enabled to be free of them and get power over them. So this priest wrote and he said, I cannot begin to tell you what clarity reading your book has given me. And now that the problems have been named, I have so much more peace in my heart. It's like I now know what we're dealing with. Before it was an amorphous cloud of confusion, but with your book there's a new light, praise God. And it's actually inspired me to preach more courageously. Uh, so anyway, he, he, he just goes on to talk about how it's helped him in his ministry. A lot of priests are kind of reeling today, like saying, what's going on? We're having cardinals contradicting cardinals and bishops contradicting bishops and strange things are being said in Rome. And what, what are we gonna do about keeping our head clear and our hearts at peace? Well, Archbishop Gomez, the Archbishop of Los Angeles, a couple of years ago was asked to give a talk at a conference in Portugal uh, explaining what woke culture was. And this is what he said. An elite leadership class has risen in our countries that has little interest in religion and no real attachments to the nations they live in or to local traditions or cultures. This group, which is now in charge in corporations, governments, universities, the media, and in the cultural and professional establishments, wants to establish what we might call a global civilization. And as they see it, Christianity only gets in the way of the society they hope to build. Now, there's no question about it. There's always been a battle between Christ and the evil one through, throughout history, you know, beginning at the beginning. But in recent years, the Christian culture that used to be predominant in our country is increasingly under explicit attack. Uh, it's out in the open now. There are people who are absolutely dedicated to limiting the influence and hopefully erasing it of Christ in the church. Now, Archbishop Gomez talked about some of the structural things that are happening that you know, lots of the influential structures in our society are now under the control of people who are hostile to Christ in the church. I, I just read an article yesterday by a priest in Alexandria. He says, you know what the gay flag is really signifying? A new religion. It's a new religion. And it's requiring subservience and surrender on the part of all of us. Now, Pope Benedict XVI, after he resigned, kept writing and he kept speaking. And one of the things he did is he put his finger on how this is not just about power and politics, but this is really a spiritual battle. So this is what he said. He said, 100 years ago, everybody would have considered it to be absurd to speak of a homosexual marriage. Today, one is being excommunicated by society if one opposes it. The same applies to abortion and to the creation of human beings in the laboratory. Modern society 
is in the middle of formulating an anti-Christian creed. And if one opposes it, one is being punished by society with excommunication. And then he puts his finger on it. The fear of the spiritual power of the Antichrist is then only more than natural, and it really needs the help of prayers on the part of an entire diocese and of the universal church in order to resist it. Now, it's not frequent that one hears a pope speak about the Antichrist. It's something you hear more on the radio with Pentecostal preachers and that type of thing. But here's Pope Benedict saying what's really going on here is the Antichrist trying to create a new religion with him at the center and a new creed. And he's putting pressure on us to give our assent to the articles of the new creed, which he mentioned some of them there. Abortion is the great sacred action that people are willing to die for and kill for. And then all the other things that flow from that. Now, what Pope Benedict said is mainstream Catholicism, believe it or not. And listen to what the Catechism says about the work of the Antichrist. Before Christ's second coming, the church must pass through a final trial. This is from section 675 of the Catechism. Before Christ's second coming, the church must pass through a final trial that will shake the faith of many believers. The the faith of many believers is being shaken. It's being shaken in our families, our relatives, our parishes. Uh, many, many parishes in the United States have not recovered from COVID loss. Some parishes have 20 to 40% fewer parishioners showing up anymore. And it just kind of reveals that the thing hadn't gone deep enough, that there wasn't that personal loyalty to Christ. There wasn't that understanding of the life or death message that Christianity really is. It goes on to say, the persecution that accompanies her pilgrimage on earth will unveil the mystery of iniquity in the form of a religious deception offering men an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from the truth. This supreme religious deception is that of the Antichrist a pseudo-messianism by which man glorifies himself in place of God and of his Messiah come in the flesh. That, that's what's happening. Large sections of the elite stratas of society are glorifying themselves in the place of God. They're saying, let's do away with this old-fashioned medieval superstition Let's really devote ourselves to science solving every problem, technology solving every problem. I read an interview with an engineer from Microsoft a couple of years ago who said, if we can just hold on for another five or seven years, we'll be able to live forever by connecting ourselves to whatever. And the funny thing is, is that who wants to live forever in the fallen state that we're in? Who wants to live forever as slaves to sin? Whoever wants to live forever possessed by jealousy and greed and lust and hostility and anger? What we need is something more than a prolongation of biological life. Biological life is flawed, isn't it? There's wounds in our soul, there's wounds in our brain, there's wounds in our bodies. What we really need is a root recreation. What we really need is a root healing. What we really need is something way beyond what science or technology will ever be able to produce. We need to be born again of water and the spirit. We need to actually become part of Christ's body himself. We need to become temples of the Holy Spirit. And we need the seed of eternal life to be planted in us. We need the promise and the hope 
of resurrection from the dead. The root problem of the human race is sin. The greatest sign of sin is death. Everybody dies sooner or later. You know, even if our consciousness gets uploaded into a computer, the, the power source could fail someday. The temperature control could go wrong. A hydrogen bomb could explode over the data center where our data is stored. What we need is what we see in Jesus. Somebody who died but rose again to new life. Rose again, never more to die, <clears throat> never more to suffer, and offering us that hope and that promise. We need to have our sin forgiven so that death will not be the end, but the beginning of supernatural life, eternal life. A life that we see in the body of Jesus as he rises from the dead, and he still can eat and drink, but he can walk through walls. That's a pretty, com pretty great combination, isn't it? To be able to appear and disappear, to be able to walk through walls, and yet to be able to still hang out with his friends and eat and drink. It's, it's amazing what the Lord's promising us, and that's the only thing that will ever be a solution to what's wrong with us. That's the only thing that will ever be a solution to our deepest sorrow, our deepest fears. One of the most powerful scenes in the Gospel, after Lazarus dies, have, have, you, seen, have you seen season four of The Chosen where the you know, Lazarus is raised from the dead? Oh, it's, it's, the best, it's the best raising of Lazarus I've ever seen. It's, it's, it's really amazing. <clears throat> It shows how, how much Jesus was connected to that family, how much Jesus liked to hang out with Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, what real friendship they had, and how the Lord could kind of like hang out and relax there. And then his friend Lazarus dies, and he, he purposely stays away for a couple days. And, and Mary and Martha said, Lord, if you were here, he wouldn't have died. His disciples didn't understand what he was doing. And then, and then he calls Lazarus, come forth. And he comes forth. And then he tells Martha, Martha, Lazarus will rise again. And Martha says, I know he'll rise again on the last day. She says, no. I am the resurrection and the life. And whoever believes in me even if he die, Jesus knows that we're going to still continue to die, we'll live forever. What an incredible eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball promise. If you believe in me, even if you die, you'll live forever. What a promise of resurrection. That's, that's what we need. That's what everybody needs. Now, if the Antichrist is abroad, as he is, if many of the major power centers in our culture are under his control, either directly or indirectly, what are we going to do? Well, there's the church. You know, way back in 1976, Cardinal Wattila two years before he got elected as John Paul II, came to the Eucharistic Congress in Philadelphia, and he said some pretty amazing things. He repeated it several times on his trip to the United States. And he said, we're now standing in the kind of final confrontation between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between the church and the anti-church. There's such a thing as an anti-gospel, there's such a thing as an anti-church between Christ and the anti-Christ. He says, most people don't realize this is what's going on, but it's a test that the Lord in his providence is putting before the church, and we need to face it with courage. Now, if, if the church was able to speak with a clear voice today, 
This is the hour of its mission. This is the hour where the church needs to boldly proclaim that Jesus Christ is our only hope. This is the hour where the church needs to boldly proclaim the good news of God's purpose for marriage and sexuality. This is the hour where Jesus needs to be proclaimed as the only hope and the only savior for the human race. But just when the hour of opportunity where the invitation to courage or boldness has arrived, we're experiencing a level of confusion and division that I never thought I would see. We're seeing whole bishops' conferences saying, we don't believe that Catholic teaching on sexuality is solidly founded and we need to uh, loosen our teaching. The person whom Pope Francis is appointed to lead the synodal process into a new way of being church is on record for saying he doesn't believe what the Catholic Church teaches about homosexuality. And there's definitely an intensive campaign to normalize sexual immorality, irregular relationships. Not only that, but we have We have whole continents like Africa. When the recent document on same-sex blessings came out, saying, despite the sophistication and subtlety of the argumentation, we're not gonna do it. Our people know that this is leaning in the direction of normalization of homosexuality, and we're not gonna do it. Now, Africa's being written off as primitive, they haven't had the sophisticated European theology that you know we've had the advantage of, but that's not what they said. The statement of the African Bishops' Conferences begins by saying, this is against the word of God. This is, and they quote all those very, very clear scriptures about how this is not God's will for human beings. And then they go on to say, in our culture, there's no way that this wouldn't be scandalous. Now, Pope Francis recently said, eventually everybody's gonna come around to this, but the Africans are a special case. In their culture, they think this is ugly. That's one of the most shocking things I've heard. It's distorting what the African bishops are saying. They're not just arguing from their culture, they're including that as part of their argument, but they're primarily saying, this is against the word of God. Now, even in our own country, there's division amongst bishops. Cardinal McElroy, San Diego, saying we gotta really open the doors to all these relationships and not really require people to repent or live chaste lives in order to receive communion. Then we have Archbishop Aquila in Denver, Bishop Propraki in Illinois saying, this is heresy. So we have a serious problem of division, of confusion, of contradiction. But Jesus is the Lord. And like John Paul II said, this is something God's permitting. It's a test, it's a trial. But what does it mean for us? We can't, we can't handle things like papal appointments. We can't solve disputes between bishops and cardinals. What can we do? We can get our head clear about what the truth is and our heart deeply committed to the one who is the truth. Because of what's happening in the world, because of what's happening in the church, we need to up our game. Us regular Joes need to become semi-heroic Joes. We're not asking for complete heroism, just a little bit more. Just a little bit more courage. Just a little bit more boldness. Just a little bit more personal love for Jesus. Just a little bit more concern for people's salvation. That's all. But that will make a difference. I think where it needs to begin is recovering our confidence in the inspiration and inerrancy of God's Word. 
Catholics are confused what to think about scripture, right? It's sort of enrichment for the spiritual life, uh, but you know, it's, it's a culture from thousands of years ago, and not sure how to take everything, and you know, we don't know Greek, or we don't know Hebrew, well, apparently people in Our Lady of Good Counsel know Greek and Hebrew. <laughs> that was a joke, okay. Uh, and, and we just feel a little intimidated by sacred scripture. But one of the few places in scripture where it says Jesus rejoiced, Jesus rejoiced because what the learned and clever couldn't understand because of the condition of their mind and their soul, the merest of children could understand. It's not rocket science. It's very simple. Those who believe and are baptized and stay faithful to that to the time they die will be saved. And those who don't believe and don't obey and don't remain faithful will be lost. What does the Catholic Church say about how we should approach sacred scripture? What it says in the whole, the whole document in Vatican II, Dei Verbum. And it says, the primary author of sacred scripture is God. I, I think this is a really good, really helpful book, but it's not inspired by God. I think it's sort of inspired by the Holy Spirit a little bit, who is God, but it's not like the Bible. God, the document goes on to say, God works through human authors, through their mentality, through their culture, through their psychology, but what he inspires them to assert is being asserted by God who can neither deceive nor be deceived. And in section 11 it says, everything asserted by the sacred authors should be considered to be asserted by the Holy Spirit and to teach faithfully, firmly, and without error those truths that God wished to consign to the sacred writings for the sake of our salvation. We need to know the Word of God, we need to love the Word of God. And I, you know, the most important decision I ever made in my life, I was a senior at Notre Dame. I was thrashing around, searching for the truth. I had shaken loose from my childhood faith and was just confused. And finally, I became a philosophy major because I thought, you know, philosophy is all about knowing the truth. But, but the more philosophy I studied, the more confused I got. It's human opinion. It is. It's human opinion. I needed something solider. And then a friend basically harassed me into making a cursillo, which is a long weekend retreat that, you know, it's been, it's happened here in the Archdiocese, Detroit and Lansing over the years. It's more or less active or interactive at different times. But I didn't want to go. I told my friend, I know what's going to happen. People are going to have this warm human interaction and they're going to think it's God. And I'm not going to fall for it. I'm a philosophy major. I'm extremely happy to report that I fell for it. I heard a beautiful explanation of the faith from the priests who were giving talks. But the thing that really got me was lay people like regular Joes talking about Jesus. Like they really had a relationship with him. And that kind of shook me up. I had gotten into thinking of Jesus as a philosophical, theological puzzle. Let's talk about Christology. Let's not talk about Jesus. Then at a certain point, in Our Lady of Fatima Retreat House on the campus of Notre Dame, which is not there any longer, I just felt like this Jesus, who they're talking about, is here. And that was kind of a shocking perception. I didn't hear any voices, I didn't see any visions, but it's just like, I think he's here. Just sometimes when you're aware of the presence of somebody, but maybe you can't see them. And I knew that if he really was 
hear that he really had been raised from the dead and that he really was the Lord. And even though I didn't hear any words or see any visions, I felt like there was a clear communication from him just by making me aware of his existence. And if I would put into words what he was saying, I am who I am. He was declaring himself as divine. He was declaring himself as God. I knew that I had some decisions to make. I really was enjoying searching for the truth, but I had kind of hoped I wouldn't find it so quickly. I was looking forward to many more enjoyable years searching for the truth on my own terms. And I had plans for my future. I tried to bargain with the Lord. Okay, Lord, I'll go back to Mass. He said, "Uh uh-uh. I want something more than that. I realized that at a certain point, the only sensible response to make to the Lord is unconditional surrender. I give up. I'm yours. You're the Lord. And it wasn't until Sunday morning I was able to swallow my pride and go to the sacrament of reconciliation and be reconciled to the Lord and the church. Most important decision in my life. But the second most important decision happened a couple weeks later. I knew I wasn't always going to experience the Lord's presence or the Lord's love. But I knew that this was the most important truth in my life, the most important relationship in my life, and I needed to build into my life a regular time of paying attention to God. I needed to begin taking a daily personal prayer time and meditating on God's Word. Well, you know, that was more than 50 years ago. And I've had my share of sleepy prayer times and distracted prayer times and skipped prayer times and shortened prayer times and looking at my watch prayer times. But somehow or other, it's been enough to have the Lord keep His hand on me and keep a hold on me and keep me little by little growing. I would say two things. One, if you haven't recognized who this Jesus is, if you haven't understood that the only sensible response to make to Him is unconditional surrender, honestly, things aren't all going to fall into place until you do that. The most important scripture passage in my life, my, my family, my marriage, incidentally I'm married, I have six kids, 19 grandchildren, so I'm kind of a regular Joe too, you know? And the most important scripture passage is when I was sitting above Campus Corner Drugstore in Ann Arbor, engaged to be married, but only having two part-time jobs, I was kind of saying, Lord, how is this gonna work? And I felt like the Lord gave me a scripture passage, Luke chapter 12, where Jesus says, the unbelievers are always worried about what they're going to eat, what they're going to drink, what they're going to wear. But I tell you, seek first the kingdom of God and his holiness, and these other things will be yours as well, because your heavenly Father knows you need these things. Now, this is not the prosperity gospel. This is not where he promises us a Mercedes or a Tesla or whatever the hottest car is, whatever the biggest sign of stature and and prosperity is, but it's a solemn promise from God himself that if we put him first in our life, he's going to take care of everything that's necessary for us to fulfill the purpose for which he created us. What a source of peace, what a source of freedom, what a powerful way to overcome fear, remembering the promise of the Lord himself that if we put him first and seek first the kingdom of God, God the Father will provide us what we need. And I can say that is a true promise and it's never failed me. Every now and then, a circumstance comes up where I say, whoa, this is really challenging. But then I remember the word of the Lord. 
So we just need to every day take some time for personal prayer and meditating on, on scripture. They're handing out free copies of Magnificat here. That's one of the greatest blessings that, that we have today in the church, you know? Uh, if, if you don't subscribe to Magnificat, and incidentally, the Magnificat doesn't even know that I'm promoting them. I don't get any commission for this. I just sincerely believe it. It's a tremendous help to give a little structure to daily prayer, you know, morning prayer, the scripture readings of the, of the mass, and you know, almost a day doesn't go by where, where something in the scripture or something in the psalm doesn't kind of connect with me. Okay, sometimes it sounds a little mysterious to say have a daily prayer time, meditate in the word of God. I'm gonna tell you exactly how I do it because it isn't rocket science. A number of years ago, I was at Fatima, and I just really made the connection between Our Lady of Fatima Retreat House and Fatima, where I really connected with those three little children who are saints, you know, Jacinta, Francisco, and Lucia. And I read Lucia's story about what really happened. And until she wrote this down at the request of the bishop, people didn't know that a year before Mary appeared, an angel was appearing to the children. And he was teaching them how to pray. The first time the angel appeared in 1916, uh, they, they described it as like a shimmering light. And then he says, pray like this. And then the angel bowed down with his forehead towards the ground and said, I believe in you, I adore you, I hope in you, and I love you. And I ask your pardon for those who don't believe in you and don't adore you and don't hope in you and don't love you. And he repeated it three times. That's how I begin my prayer time. You don't have to do it that way. I find it helpful as a way of remembering who God is uh, and just bowing down before him, remembering the holiness of God. And then I'll just kind of take my cup of coffee. This is a drug fueled contemplation. <laughs> I see you have coffee cups on your regular Joe shirts. And I'll just sit in this nice chair my wife bought for me about 40 years ago that's really still working. And I'll just be with the Lord a little bit. I'll look at this icon of Jesus that I have hanging on my wall and I'll just feel like sometimes he's affirming me, sometimes he's showing mild displeasure at me not paying enough attention to him. You know, I, you know, I can't explain what's going on when you look at the icon, but it's, it's helpful to have holy images that can help open our mind and heart to the Lord. And then after about 15 or 20 minutes, when I start getting distracted, I'll pick up my Magnificat. And I'll just start slowly going through morning prayer and there's a little place for intercessions. And so I get out my intercession list of people that I'm praying for. Then I'll do the daily readings and things like that. So, and then I'll put the Magnificat down and I'll just be with the Lord some more. And if I'm kind of distracted, I might pick up some spiritual reading. So that's kind of, that's what I do. Now, St. Francis de Sales says, busy Catholic lay people shouldn't pray longer than an hour a day unless their spiritual director says it's okay. So whatever you do, don't pray more than an hour a day unless my senior Todd or Father's age says it's okay because we don't want to neglect our lay responsibilities. But the reason why St. Francis de Sales says we need to spend substantial time in daily prayer, he says, how do you expect in the busyness of your lives you know, family and work and all the things that are going on to be there with a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit, with the mind and heart of Christ, unless you're actually spending substantial time with them. So, hey, important, really important. Now, in my remaining five or 10 minutes, I want to identify a couple areas where the faith and the truth and human life is particularly under attack. The tip of the spear that's coming against us is trying to destroy how God created the human race, male and female, in the area of marriage and sexuality. Sister Lucia, you know, who Mary said, you know, Jacinta and Francisco are gonna to come to me soon, and they died early, uh, but you're gonna to have to stay here a little while longer. So she had to stay another 87 years. That's what a little while means to, to the Lord. 
And, and she wrote a letter to Cardinal Cafara, who is head of the John Paul II Institute for Marriage and the Family, which has been totally gutted now. And she said, Mary has told me the final attack of Satan is going to be on marriage and the family. That's what's going on right now, big time. That's where the rebellion is. That's where the deception is. So we need to get really clear in our head what's the truth about marriage and sexuality in order to not be deceived. It's simple. God created us male and female for the purpose of a man and woman coming together in holy marriage, open to life. That's it. But this has really significant implications. Every exercise of genital sexuality outside of holy marriage is offensive to the Lord and damaging to people and could endanger our eternal salvation. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul says, don't let anybody deceive you. The immoral, and the exact word is porneia, Dr. Mary Healy, who teaches with me at Sacred Heart Seminary, is on a committee to revise the translation of the New American Bible. She says they're probably going to translate it for what it really says. But even without that, Paul goes on to say, the fornicator, the adulterer, the person who engages in homosexual activity, not talking about orientation or temptation, but doing sexual things with somebody of the same sex. The drunkard, the idolater, the robber will not enter the kingdom of God. Now remembering what the Catholic Church teaches about sacred scripture, this is asserted by God for our salvation. It's important we pay attention to it. That means masturbation, pornography, living together before marriage, adultery, homosexual behavior uh, could exclude us from the kingdom of God. This is said not to keep us from any happiness. This is said not to keep us from joy. This has told us to lead us towards true happiness and true joy and the true purpose for which we were created. I know it's challenging. I know the culture is just kind of, kind of drowning us in sexual temptation, encouraging us to give in to disordered desires. But that's why it's so important we need to be clear about what the truth is. And incidentally, everything I'm saying today is in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. It doesn't leap off the page. That's why I need to leap a little bit here to get your attention to the significance of this truth. Okay, one other thing. Salvation. Heaven and hell. If I were to describe how many of our fellow Catholics are looking at the world today, I describe it like this. Broad and wide is the way that leads to heaven. And almost everybody's going that way. But narrow is the door and difficult the road that leads to hell and hardly anybody's going that way. Now even though you can't read Greek or Hebrew, I bet there's some Bible believing regular Joes here. What's wrong with this picture? Yes. It's exactly the opposite of what Jesus tells us the situation is. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Jesus says, broad and wide is the way that leads to destruction. It's easy. And many people are going that way. Hey, open your eyes and look around. Doesn't it look like that's still the case today? But narrow is the door and difficult a road that leads to life, and few there are who are finding it. Now, we're not fundamentalists. We need to take in the whole scriptural witness together and what the church actually teaches. We know from 1 Timothy chapter 2 that God wills the salvation of the whole human race. He doesn't want anybody to be lost. But we also know that he doesn't force anybody to be saved. One of the most popular devotions in the Catholic Church today is the Divine Mercy devotion. And the primary message of Divine Mercy is the greatest of sinners should not hesitate at all to come to the Lord and they're most deserving of God's mercy. But another important part of the Divine Mercy revelations of St. Faustina, nobody talks about. Section 741 of her diary, the Lord sends an angel to take her on a tour of hell. 
And it's awful what she sees, and she writes it down, and she says, the Lord told me to write it down so that nobody can say that nobody's been there and can't say what it's like. At Fatima, Mary showed these seven, nine, and ten-year-old children a terrifying vision of souls in hell. And they looked up at Mary, and Mary said, this is hell where the souls of poor sinners go. And then later on, she said, so many souls are being lost because so few people are willing to pray and offer sacrifice for them. We all have people in our life that we're concerned for, right? But if we're really concerned about sons or daughters or relatives or friends, we're not only going to be praying for them to get healed of their illnesses or get good jobs or whatever, we're going to be praying for their eternal salvation. We're going to be praying that they open their soul to the Lord and be saved rather than lost and repent and believe. Now, if I hope this isn't the case, but in many Catholic elementary schools these days, if a teacher told the children about the reality of hell and the importance of avoiding it, they probably would be fired. If Mary was teaching seven, nine, and 10 year old children today in many schools, she'd be banned for life. She'd be deemed a danger to children. There's a tremendous pressure not to talk about the eternal consequences. There's a tremendous pressure not to accept the, the truth that's revealed to us by God. And it's not an isolated text. Galatians chapter five. I, I got two minutes, I think. Galatians chapter 5, Paul goes through a whole list of terrible stuff and he says, I warn you as I warned you before, that do these, people who do these things will not enter the kingdom of God. So we're not talking about optional extras, we're not talking about something to enrich your life, we're not talking about something that is good for spiritual people, we're talking about heaven or hell for every human being on the face of the earth. Ephesians chapter 5. The impure person will not inherit the kingdom of God. And because of this, the wrath of God is breaking out against the disobedient. Revelation chapter 21. Tremendous picture of heavenly peace and heavenly bliss. No more sorrow, no more tears. But also, the lake of fire. The second death. First death is biological death. Not a problem for a Christian. But for somebody who dies unrepentant and unbelieving, a problem, the second death, hell. Who's in the lake of fire? Those who culpably refuse to believe in the Lord. This next one was a shock, cowards. This is serious business. Jesus said, if you are ashamed of me before people, I'm gonna be ashamed of you before my Father in heaven. How could, how could good, loving, gentle Jesus ever say something like that? It's because he knows what's at stake. He knows that he's the lifeline that God has given to the human race and to pretend he's not who he is and to deny people the opportunity to grab a hold of him and be saved is a serious business fornicators in the lake of fire, so on and so forth. Okay, let's conclude. Jesus is the Lord. Unconditional surrender is the only sensible response to him. Gotta make it concrete and real. Gotta pay attention to the Lord. Gotta take some time for prayer and meditating on God's word. The world is full of lies and pressures, deceptions and distortions. We really need to get clear on what the truth is about human life. We really need to get clear about what the truth is about marriage and sexuality. And we need to really get clear about what's really at stake. And that there's a broad way that leads to destruction. Hell is real. There's a narrow way that leads to life. The life of the cross, the way of the cross, the way of saying no to sin and yes to God, the way of losing our life in this world but gaining it forever. I'm gonna have to leave in just a few minutes, but 
one of the most frustrating things I ever do in life is give one talk. You probably could tell. There's a lot more stuff I'd like to say. But I'm somewhat consoled by the fact that I have been able to put it into books. And so, if you know the Lord has more for you in terms of relationship with Him, if maybe you've plateaued out or kind of just stop where you are, this is the book for you. The Fulfillment of All Desire, a guidebook for the journey to God based on the wisdom of the saints. It's the best wisdom the Catholic Church has organized in a clear, easy to way to understand. This next book, A Church in Crisis Pathways Forward, I wanted to just end by reading something that my daughter sent me. Now, my kids generally don't read my books. Uh, my son went to a poker game last night rather than coming with me to the wake, you know, but he's going to join me at the, at the funeral mass. You know how it is. But my daughter said, Dad, would you believe this? I just came across it on Amazon Book Reviews. This is a review of this book, A Church in Crisis. It says, I wish I were a millionaire. I would buy enough copies of this book to pass out to every Catholic Christian in the world. It will open your eyes, it will reaffirm your faith, it will bring you back to the church if you've left it, or make you more devout if you have not. If you're a Bible-believing Christian of any faith, you need to read this book. And he, she goes to Mars. She says, you cannot put this book down. So be careful if you pick it up. She says, I only stop reading it to eat and sleep until I finish the book. So uh, I have a lot more I wish I could share with you. These two books are a way of doing it. Sammy Wan, who I believe is an ordinary, regular Joe, is going to be at the book table and be able to take care of you at our, our, our first long break. So thank you very much. God bless you. Good. I'd like to begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord God, we thank you for the gift of salvation won for us in Christ Jesus. We thank you for all the many ways throughout your word in the Old and New Testament that you have spoken to your people to, rem to remind them of your love, your steadfast, enduring, sacrificial love. Help us as your men, as your sons, to be faithful fathers in our community so that we may lead all men and women to truth. We make this prayer in the name of your Son, who is Lord forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Father Zaid. I serve here at OLGC, and um, it's a true honor and blessing to be here at this men's conference and to see so many uh, familiar faces and new faces. Um, our parish, particularly, uh, as every parish, is filled with many blessings, but one of the blessings of our community is our regular Joe MPB's ministry. And so to all of the the brothers, I know how much I'm grateful for you and how much your faith inspires me to be a better man and a better priest. So we read in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may prove what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. We have chosen this line from the book of Romans to be the scriptural theme for our conference. For the writer of the epistle, transformation is connected to renewal, and today we seek to be renewed by our exposure to what we are confronting in our culture, mindful that we approach all of these issues as people of hope, men who believe in the victory of Christ on the cross. The preacher to the papal household, now Cardinal Cantalamesa, beautifully expresses the challenge the Christian faces living in the world in his first Sunday of Lent sermon back in 2018 when he writes, quote, Faith is the primary battleground between the Christian and the world. It is through faith that the Christian is no longer of the world. We must engage the world, but we must remember the words of St. Therese, who reminds us the world is thy ship, not thy home. We are called to live in the world, but not to conform to the world. And so our gathering this morning is to give us a glimpse of what we face around us so that we can be better equipped to stand in truth as men of faith, knowing that Christ comes to set all of us free. St. Paul writes to the church in Thessalonica, quote, 
So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. If we really look at human history and even the history of the Word of God, even in 2024, the biggest temptation in humanity has always been to want to mimic God, to become God. Mary Stanford writes this quote, and it's listed on your handout. She's a professor of theology at Christendom College, and she writes, from the beginning we see that humanity has been tempted to doubt the very identity of God. Is he a personal God who can only be known through a trusting relationship? Or is he a mere object whose mystery is no more than a puzzle for us to solve and appropriate through detached, calculated grasping? If God is an object, then a free creature cannot respond to such a mystery through trust, but instead only through a bold taking of what was not really offered. Viewed in such a light, God's supposed generosity can be dismissed simply as a restriction on our freedom rather than its source. Our first parents refusing to make the trusting leap that is essential to knowing a person mistook God for an object. And in our modern society, we seek not only to imitate God, to become God, but even to eliminate God. And the death of God is also the death of human nature, for human nature finds its origin and purpose in God. Atheistic philosophers, particularly those of the last 150 years, have always seen religion as a hindrance to the flourishing of man. I will admit that some of the examples I'll be using in just a moment are quite shocking. Some of them are pretty recent. Some of them span over the last 50 years. Some of them might be a little graphic in nature. But in order to understand what's going on, we have to know what's going on. And so how did we get here is the title of my talk. When reflecting on headlines around you, you might have asked, how did it get so bad and how did it get bad so fast? The problems we face, brothers, did not start in this century. They did not start with politicians in Washington, D.C. They have been going on for decades over 200 years. Jonah Erickson Tata, an American evangelical Christian author, radio host, and founder of Joni and Friends, writes, quote, and gradually, though no one remembers exactly how it happened, the unthinkable becomes tolerable, and then acceptable, and then legal, and then applaudable. Indeed, much of what is applauded as normal today would have been incomprehensible a hundred years ago. Such as the transgender surgery market being a $2.1 billion industry. The 20th century was supposed to be a century of progress. However, much of the progress we hoped for never arrived. The prophet Isaiah had wise words for the people of his time and they hold true for us today. Isaiah writes, quote, Woe to those who call good evil and good woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Our moral compass today has been obliterated to the point where the following examples have become completely normalized. Singer Lizzo promised that she would donate five hundred thousand of proceeds from her concerts in twenty twenty two to Planned Parenthood and additional abortion providers. More recently, pop star Olivia Rodrigo, a Disney teen star, also promised to donate proceeds from her current tour to abortion advocacy groups and has also partnered with them in Missouri to pass out contraceptives at her concerts. And who is at these concerts? Teenage girls, your nieces and neighbors, on May 26, 2022, Democratic State Senator Tyra Mack of Rhode Island, who calls herself a queer educator, donut lover, and abortion fundraiser, on her Twitter profile, and who later became infamous for a viral self-promotional campaign video of her standing on her head and twerking upside down, 
tweeted a picture of 100 or 200 teens lying on the ground of the Rhode Island State Capitol with the following caption, quote, students from a few Providence schools walked out today and laid down for three minutes outside of the Rhode Island State House. Will we pass common sense gun legislation this session in Rhode Island? While students protest in Rhode Island, 94% of Providence students are failing mathematics and 86% can read or write at grade level. As I reflect on our culture, I think this example from human history paints a very beautiful picture to what becomes normalized now becomes applaudable. Consider the following case study from the 1920s. Until the 1920s, almost 100 years ago, it was considered improper for women to smoke publicly. George Washington Hill's American Tobacco Company hired Edward Bernays to assist in their business. Bernays was known for his belief and promotion of propaganda and mass manipulation. In his book, We Will Not Be Silenced by Erwin Lutzer, he writes, quote, the purpose of propaganda is to change people's perception of reality so that despite compelling ev counter evidence, people will not change their minds. The goal is to make people impervious to facts, scientific proof, and common sense. And so Bernays helped Hill in his tobacco company to convince women that if they smoked openly in public, they could double their business. And so, how do you accomplish that? Well, Bernays came up with this idea. Remind women they are oppressed and call cigarettes torches of freedom. In 1929, a group of women gathered at the New York Easter Sunday Parade while smoking. Nothing was ever said about the negative effects of smoking, but people saw these women in the parade and what was once unheard of somehow became normal and acceptable. This public manipulation example and other propaganda strategies are being employed today with a range of controversial issue, issues and behaviors. In my undergraduate studies, I transitioned from pre-law at Oakland University to studying history, which I had always loved. I took a course in both the American and French Revolution, not at the same time. And while my professors in both classes highlighted the similarities between both the American and French Revolution, there are stark differences. The French Revolution in particular never achieved the liberty, equality, and freedom it had hoped to achieve. In fact, one of the key proponents during the revolution, Robespierre, who stood by enlightenment principles and sought to bring about change amongst the French people, was conversely responsible for the death of many people in his country through the guillotine. This has been true for many throughout history, brothers, and we will meet different individuals who have helped create the cultural landscape that we face today. While these individuals sought a change, they actually have caused more destruction than change. And so, how did we get here? One example that I think is prevalent to remember is a movement that began almost 100 years ago that originated in Germany called the Frankfurt School. It began in 1923 and it began as the Institute for Social Research, and it wanted to promote Marxism in Germany. The modern day concept of the autonomy of the self and the concept that we hear all the time of my freedom and my choice develops from the philosophy of Karl Marx. Marx was born in Germany and came from a, land, a line of rabbis. And in his early childhood, his family converted to Lutheranism. He studied in Paris, and there he met a buddy, Frederick Engels, 
a philosopher also, who in 1844 helped define modern communism. Marx and Engels published together a somewhat famous book called The Communist Manifesto. One of the key tenets of this philosophy is that capitalism was the enemy and a, cast, and a classless society was the answer. Marx was also an admirer of Ludwig Feuerbach, who was a philosopher and anthropologist who wrote The Essence of Christianity. He is referred to as the father of modern atheism. Marx believed that all events and ideas are expressions of human nature and that culture through a process of internal tensions will lead societies toward elevated cultural consciousness. Being alert or woke as we would call it today. Well, what is key to understanding Marx also for us is his view towards Christianity. Marx hated Christianity, seeing it as a source of oppression, as many unfortunately do today. Even calling for its elimination. Yet Marx was not the only one. Many figures like him, Georg Lukács, Vladimir Lenin, Antonio Gramsci, and others believed that Christianity was dangerous and needed to be eliminated. And so today, a lot of us, even in our workplace, hear about the oppressed and the oppressor. Certain groups of people are deemed the oppressed and the oppressor. Everyone belongs to some class, and in some ways, some of us or all of us are oppressing one another. Today, the tenets of Marxism permeate our American culture. And today, the term cultural Marxism, brothers, is used to express many of the issues we hear about in our newsfeed. Book banning, drag queen story hours, use of pronouns at the workplace. Cultural Marxism also believes, as Dr. Martin talked about quoting Sister Lucia, that the nuclear family needs to be dismantled. And we are all aware of that taking place today. I come from a family where the nuclear family was not intact, and the effects of an absent father, and the effects of being raised in a single home still impact me today. Dr. Peter Kreeft, in his book, How to Destroy Civilization and Other Ideas from the Cultural Abyss, writes, so family and religion are the two main causes of individuals being morally good. And morally good individuals are the main causes of a good society. Today, parents, you as fathers, are taught that you have no authority over your children. They belong to the state or to their school. Historically, when Marxism has been victorious, it has come at a cost with the lives of millions and millions of people dying through their oppressive system. And it's interesting that while Marxism seeks to destroy oppression, it itself is very oppressive. Now, this Frankfurt School is in Germany in 1923, so how is it impacting us as Americans in Plymouth on this Saturday? Well, the Frankfurt School moved to the United States in 1935 to New York City. With famed educator and Soviet sympathizer John Dewey, who took this train of thought, promulgating Marxism, into our universities. He founded the laboratory school at the University of Chicago in 1896. He believed that equality was the primary goal of society and inflexible resistance to change was the chief goal to achieving this. And so today we hear a lot about critical theory, don't we? This is where it comes from. The Frankfurt School made a big impact on not only our universities, but our schools. And it is our schools where our children are being formed 40 hours a week, 88 hours a day. However, 
Before I start giving you some modern day examples, I can't help but mention another impactful force. Our public school systems today, and I'm a product of public schools K through 12, don't hold it against me. I was a product of the state. Our public schools today are influenced by a Brazilian educator, Paulo Freire. A very well written biography of Freire and his influence on our public schools can be found in the book, The Marxification of Education by James Lindsay. Lindsay notes, quote, Paulo Freire was not merely an educator, he was a post-colonialist, radical, and a Marxist. He must also be understood as a religious figure, specifically a liberation theologian, or at least a devotee to liberation theology, which is best summarized by saying it is Marxism pretending to be Catholicism. Freire changed the theory of education into a Marxist theory of pedagogy or teaching or instruction. And what is his goal? To turn your children into Marxists. I'd like to highlight the landscape of our country by mentioning some events. Many of us know of them, some of us may not. And again, some of these you may want to research, some of them you may have no interest in. Again, this is not an exhaustive list, but it highlights what I believe are some important factors that can help put into perspective where we are as a culture today. So if you're wondering where I am in my talk, we've reached the halfway point, and after this, we come to the conclusion. But I'm not telling you when that is. In 1914, Right at the start of the First World War in 1914 to 1918, a woman named Margaret Sanger came to light. She was influenced by the ideas of cultural Marxism and launched her own newspaper called The Woman Rebel, which promoted moral and political anarchy. Her motto was, no gods, no masters. We know the impact of Sanger today. She was a eugenicist and a racist herself, and is considered to be the founder of Planned Parenthood. Alfred Kinsey, in 1947, founded his Institute for Sex Research. And John Money was a disciple of Alfred Kinsey, a psychologist in the 50s and 60s at John Hopkins. He came up with this revolutionary idea, which back then was, but today, unfortunately, is not which is that a person's identity as a male or female could be completely separate from their biology. He proposed that we are all born gender neutral with the potential of identifying ourselves later as male or female. Recent statistics have come out and said that today in America, one out of five women identify as bisexual or lesbian. First published in 1958, W. Cleon Skousen's book, The Naked Communist, expertly exposes the patient strategies of communism to remake the Western world. And there are five, 45 goals of this. I'd like to highlight two. Rule number 17, get control of the schools. Use them as transmission for socialism and current communist propaganda. Soften the curriculum. Get control of teachers' associations. Put the party line in textbooks. Rule number 27, infiltrate the churches and replace revealed religion with social religion. Discredit the Bible and emphasize the need for intellectual maturity which does not need a religious catch. Unfortunately, even within our Catholic Church, some of our parishes have become woke and are more concerned with pleasing men than God. In 1962, Engel verse Vitels was a suit brought by three Jews and two described spiritual people, complaining that the voluntary prayer written by the New York Board of Regents addressed to Almighty God 
violated their religious beliefs. And so they filed a lawsuit. And you might ask yourself, well, what was the prayer that was being said at the New York Board of Regents? It's very offensive, brothers, so get ready. Quote, Almighty God, we acknowledge our dependence upon thee, and we beg thy blessings upon us, our parents, our teachers, and our country. Amen. In the process, they created a constitutional right that had never existed before, the right of a non-believing minority to deny the majority of Americans their right to express their belief in God while at school. Madeline Murray O'Hare was the founder of American Atheists. She was the moving force behind the lawsuit Murray v. Curley, which led to Abington School District v. Scheme in 1963 you can't tell, I kind of like the law, which ended school-sponsored Bible reading in American public schools. In 1968, something remarkable came out from the Vatican during the 60s, when St. Paul VI published Humanae Vitae, which reaffirmed the Church's teaching on the sanctity of life and the Church's teaching on birth control and contraception. Listen to this statistic. After Humanae Vitae came out, attendance at weekly mass in 1963 in our country was at 71%. Almost 10 years later, that number dropped to 50%. And today, in the year 2023, that number is just barely 31%. In January 22, 1973, Roe v. Wade came out. Just this past year, over a million abortions took place in our healthcare system. Around the time of Roe, it was 800,000 a year. June 30, 1986, Browser v. Hardwick. The Supreme Court ruled that the Constitution does not protect the right of gay adults to engage in private consexual sex. In June 26, 2003, that president was overturned. And we all know what happened in 2015 with Obergefell v. Hodges, where the legalization of same-sex marriage took place under our Constitution's Equal Protection Clause. And there are many, many other examples. To close, I like to say that today we often are preached to about being tolerant. Many employers incorporate this word in many aspects of their workplace. However, some of the most intolerant people in our culture are those who preach tolerance. One of the most famous books that promoted radicalism and anarchy was Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals. Alinsky was a Satanist himself. And in his book, he writes, quote, Lucifer, the first radical who rebelled against the establishment and did it so effectively that he at least won his own kingdom. Moreover, Alinsky encouraged his followers to not speak to their opponents, to, cultiv to cultivate hypersensitivity to perceived slights by the opposing side as an easy way to stop important conversations from happening and to demonize one's opponent. Kind of what we call political correctness, don't we? Which actually did not arrive in 2008 or 2016, but back in 1917, where the term first appeared in the Marxist-Leninist vocabulary following the Bolshevik takeover of Russia in 1917. Fathers. You are the first representative of God to your children, and how you parent is of crucial importance. Fathers, your primary vocation is not to be your child's friend, but to be the person who gets them to heaven. Fathers, you are the priest of your home, and sadly, today many of our men have forgotten their role and why they exist. Fathers. Your children are not the property of the school district, the state, or the government. 
Your children were created in the image and likeness of Almighty God. And when you presented your children for baptism, their soul was marked as a child of God, and no surgery can ever remove that. Fathers, if you pay your children's cell phone bill, tuition, water bill, and heating bill, you also have a say in who your children spend their time with. And you are also responsible for the apps they have on their phone. In our country, almost 19 million people grow up without their fathers. Imagine the state of New Jersey and Michigan eliminated from the country. 85% of children and teens with behavioral, behavioral disorders come from fatherless homes. And over 70% of all adolescent patients in drug and alcohol treatment centers come from homes without fathers. I'd like to close with the words of Jehoshaphat, who, was called for a, who called for a fast when several vicious armies united against Israel. He was the fourth king of Judah, and he began his rule at the age of 35, and he ruled for 20 years. He was a great king, not perfect. His name means Yahweh has judged. And he is known to be one of the country's most successful leaders following the commands of God. When he took office in the year 837 BC, he immediately eliminated all idol worship that had consumed the land. He drove, he drove out all male cult prostitutes and destroyed the Asherah pole where the people had worshiped false gods. He went on to send prophets and priests and Levites throughout the country to teach the laws of God to his people. May we, brothers, always keep our eyes on the Lord and be transformed by the renewal of our minds, remembering that the battle belongs to God and he is victorious. The words of this passage come to us from Second Chronicles, and I'd like to close with this beautiful passage from Scripture. Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in the front of the new courtyard and said, Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. Our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? They have lived in it and have built in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, if calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and will cry out to you in our distress and you will hear us and save us. But now here are men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. See how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession you gave us as an inheritance? Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do but our eyes are on you. He said, Listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who lived in Judah and Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Amen. Dr. Nathan Schleter is professor of philosophy and religion at Hillsdale College, where he directs the pre-law program and teaches courses in social and political philosophy, ethical theory, and philosophy and literature. He is a recipient of Hillsdale's College's Doherty Award for Teaching Excellence and the teacher of the popular online course, Introduction to Western Philosophy. Nathan has a BA in history from Miami University of Ohio and an MA and PhD in politics from the University of Dallas. He is the author of One Dream or Two, Justice in America and in the Thought of Martin Luther King Jr., The Humane Vision of Wendell Berry, edited with Mark Mitchell, and co-author 
of Socialist Conservatives, the Foundations of the Libertarian Conservative Debate. His articles have appeared in First Things, Touchstone, Logos, Communio, Public Discourse and Perspectives in Political Science, but he is perhaps best known for his short video on dating. He and, Nathan, he and his wife have been a fellow of, or he is a fellow of the National Endowment for the Humanities and Princeton University's James Madison program, and he also serves on the Bishop's Commission on Catholic Social Teaching. Dr. Schleter and his wife Elizabeth homeschool their children, and he has nine beautiful children and lives in Hillsdale, and we are truly honored to welcome him to our parish, and so Dr. Schleter, welcome. So, my uh, wife insisted that I needed to begin this talk with a joke, and um, my last name is Schleter, it's a German name, we're not known for our sense of humor, uh, and I, so I didn't come up with a joke, and then I was praying the rosary on the way over in the car, and thought, okay, well maybe this will be funny. Uh, so I thought of, okay, how many woke men does it take to screw in a light bulb? I was thinking of various answers to that. F follow the, you know, the norm. Uh, uh, none, there are no woke men. <laughs> or something like, none, they're too busy trying to figure out what a man is, or none, they don't believe in light bulbs because they consume fossil fuels, which is evil. <laughs> you can imagine all the ways you could run this joke, um, but of course, uh, wokeism isn't really a joke. It's not funny, but I do think that Honestly, one of the ways, one of the most effective ways for combating wokeism is through a sense of humor because one of the things that's been lost is the ability to laugh at our weaknesses, our, 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 our foibles, our, our even unique characteristics that we share because we're just men or women or German or Irish or black or white or whatever. And so I do think we need to recover a sense of humor. Father Zaid asked me to talk about wokeism and manliness. And that was not an easy task. I didn't immediately see the connection. I asked him several times, are you sure you want to talk about wokeism and manliness? He said, yeah, yeah, just talk about woke. And I don't know Father Zaid really well, but I've, I'm gathering he's the sort of person that it's not very easy to say no to him. So he's kind of got that Middle Eastern, like, you just do that, you just do that. You, know, you find yourself nodding. Okay, I'll do that. Um, so I'm going to uh, try to do this here um, in the time I have. And I'm going to put my phone up here, and when the alarm goes off, I'll be done. Um, so John Paul II who knew something about the chal challenges of facing a hostile culture, referred to his conflict with communism as a conflict of anthropologies, of competing uh, anthropologies, two competing conceptions of man. And he thought that Christianity offered a view of man, a humanism, a conception of the person that could defeat uh, communism at its core. Okay. Talked about man made in the image and likeness of God. Um, Boethius has a famous definition, an individual substance with a rational nature. So it's our rationality that makes us human. What makes us different from other animals? We have this capacity for reason, for discovering the truth. And that same capacity for reason also makes us free because we're able to perceive certain goods that give us reasons for action and we're not just dominated by instinct or feeling or impulse. We can actually see a good and choose it. So reason and freedom 
were these core qualities of the human person that were highlighted early in the tradition in trying to identify what make what, what is the, the, the sort of core of a human person. But then these debates emerged in the fourth century over Christ, they're called the Christological debates, and Christ's relationship to the Trinity. And slowly, the, a new language and understanding of the human person emerged that were very much the focal point of St. John Paul II in his writings. And it was this, uh, that to be a person at its very core is not merely to have reason and freedom, but to be in a relationship of self-giving love. John Paul II's favorite passage, he referred to it over and over again in his writings, was from the Second Vatican Council document, Gaudium et Spes, GS 24, section 24. Man is the only creature God willed for his own sake, and yet man can never find himself except through a sincere gift of self. What do you get there? You get the dignity of the person, like we're the only creatures God made just to make us as a kind of image and likeness of him with a, with a dignity that was not instrumental to some other thing, but we can never flourish and be happy and truly be free except in relationships of self-giving love. All right, so what have I, I've identified here what I think are four core properties of the human person. I'm going to repeat them, and I want you to keep them in mind, and I'll refer back to them. Uh, reason, freedom, friendship, self-giving love and friendship, and the dignity of the person, those four things. Reason, freedom, friendship, dignity of the human person. And now what I want to say is that I think wokeism undermines all four of those. It makes them profoundly um, impossible to uh, understand and to live. And that's why we are in the midst of a kind of civilizational crisis because any civilization which denies those four features of the human person, those truths of the human person, is going to be in great danger of collapsing in on itself into the worst possible kind of despotism or tyranny, insofar as it fails to understand those truths. So what do I mean by wokeism? We've heard a little bit about wokeism. Uh, we can just broadly say that wokeism is a movement on the left that uh, that includes a, a, a family of different kinds of movements like identity politics, uh, critical race theory, uh, uh, DEI, ESG, you've heard all of these before, critical social justice, radical feminism. Uh, it includes this family of movements that have been deeply influenced by a postmodern philosophy which denies that there's truth. It's deeply influenced, as Father Zaid said, by Karl Marx, but also by another German named Friedrich Nietzsche. And it comes to us through some Americanized postmodern philosophers, especially uh, Michael Foucault and Herbert Mercuse. You can read their, their works. And we might say that all these movements with this postmodern inflection have these two properties, which we've heard, it's good to keep them in mind. Property number one is to interpret all human relations, all institutions, social relations, political relations in terms of power dynamics. Everything deep down is constituted by power dynamics. And those power dynamics involve some class of oppressors and some class of oppressed. The oppressors change. They can be white males, 
They can be the nuclear family, they can be capitalism, colonialism, they can be classical education, <clears throat> traditional views about sexuality, but these are, you identify an oppressor, and the oppressor is always guilty. It's an interesting language inside wokeism, the language of guilt. And the victims are always innocent. And the victims are the ones that don't have the power, whoever they happen to be. These days, it's mostly all non-whites, most women, the poor, anyone who holds non-traditional beliefs about human sexuality, those are the victims. And the second feature then of wokeism is a strategy to reverse. Well, what is the strategy? That's kind of the problem. Is, is the goal, be, because everything's understood in terms of power relations, it's not clear what you do. Do you just reverse the power relations or do you establish some kind of state of equality? It's very unclear, but it often looks like reversal is what's required. What needs to happen is for the victims, the victim classes to become the power classes and the, for the power classes to become the victim classes. Now, this set of movements or, or the kind of ideas that animate it, I just want to briefly indicate why these undermine or contradict those four basic truths about the human person. Start with reason. Inside that postmodern influence of wokeism is, uh, is the denial that there is any uh, universal truth. Truth is always particular to whatever class you happen to belong to. There's no such thing as capital T truth. There's a, there are only small truths or group perspectives, and often truth is translated in terms of pure feelings. Truth is what I happen to feel. When I'm feeling bad, that's truth. Uh, if you follow the congressional hearings uh, or after the horrible Hamas attack and then the, res the anti-Semitic response, uh, things that were going on in college campuses, and then um, the House of Representatives held hearings, and famously a number of Ivy League college presidents came in to explain how they were responding. Uh, one of the uh, uh, hearings that got a lot of attention was Claudine Gay, the president of Harvard University. She's no longer there, but she had this interesting uh, comment where they pressed her on uh, certain questions, and her reply was, what, situations in which, you know, is it really okay to threaten genocide against Jews? And she said, no, uh, that, that should never happen. And then she was pressed, but should, should that speech be taught? Is that free speech at Harvard? And she made this claim that was a little bit confusing. And when she was pushed on, she said, well, that's just my truth. I'm, I'm here testifying to my truth. And I want to just like focus on my truth for a moment. The thing about my truth is that it's incoherent. Uh, if truth is truth, then it's the sort of thing that any truth seeker would recognize if they were ordered in the right way. There's no such thing as my truth, because my truth is a very concrete, particular, subjective thing. But truth by its very definite definition in nature is a universal thing. Um, so when inside wokeism you're talking about my truths, which are often just how I feel about something, you're not talking about the domain of truth. You're talking about the domain of subjective feeling. But the second problem with the woke conception of truth is I think it's self-defeating. If you get rid of truth and make it subjective and then you describe everything as power relations, then uh, in the end, it's just gonna be power that wins out. You, in effect, are endorsing the rule of power when you say that's all there is is power and you refuse to identify any other principle by which people can order their lives in a just way. 
And the only reason wokeism actually works is because uh, a lot of the oppressors feel guilty. They're made to feel guilty. They're made to feel privileged and they've voluntarily surrendered at certain times and sometimes reasonable but often unreasonable ways to the pressures. They've made accommodations in order to uh, avoid the pressure that's put on them. Uh, freedom. Um, so, uh, I think there are two ways in which wokeism undermines freedom. One of them is just the denial that there's an objective good. It's a hard thought to have. It's, it takes some thinking to see why, if there's no objective good, there is no possibility of freedom. It's precisely our ability to see a good that can correct our impulses or desires or anything else. If there is no true good, then all we have is instinct and passion and impulse and subjectivity. So, and it's very denial of truth. Wokeism undermines freedom. But there's a second way that I think is important to see, and it's the focus on victimization. By describing everything in terms of oppressor and victim, and if you put yourself in the victim class and you think through the victim mindset, then what you end up doing is blaming everything else around you for your own condition or state of affairs. And there's a lot of data on this and the social sciences about the corrosive and um, the corrosive effect of a victimization mindset of what's sometimes called the state orientation rather than an action orientation. This dwelling, because then you have no agency. It's always everyone else's fault and it's never your fault. And you start thinking this way and then you think, I can't do anything. I'm helpless. And so what the mindset of wokeism tends to encourage is, it, is just a sense of utter helplessness and lack of agency. Um, third thing is friendship. I mentioned friendship. If everything is power relations, it's very hard to have a friendship. Friendships are not based upon sort of zero-sum game competitiveness. They're based upon sharing in some kind of good uh, that, that uh, you have in common. And it's very difficult to see how friendship is possible given the kind of way in which the woke think about human relations. And of course, the dignity of the human person, that last feature, what happens is that your dignity gets subsumed by the group you happen to be a member of. So there's no intrinsic human dignity. Your dignity varies based on whether you're in the oppressed group or whether you're in the victim group. Uh, and we see these strong forces nudging people into victim groups, identifying strong pressures to identify with victim groups because then your status goes up and in our culture, to some degree, your power goes up. Um, so, and, and if you're in the, in, the, in the privileged oppressor group, then you are generally meant to feel guilty and to be silent and not, and, and, and to submit to the power of the victims. Uh, final thing I want to observe before I move on here is that, um, is that the title of the talk was actually how to respond to America's great awakening. That was the full title. I, it got truncated there somehow. Um, but I think it's very important to view wokeism as a kind of religious movement. You're not going to understand the forces at work here if you don't see how it's locking in to certain deep religious propensities in our nature. America, as you know, has had these series of great awakenings, the first great awake, these sort of emotional revivals, first great awakening, George Whitfield and others, then the second great awakening, the second great awakening in the you know, early 19th century is really worth paying attention to because it actually spreads like wildfire through American culture and these revivals and revival tents, but it also gives rise to these massive justice movements, uh, prison reform, education reform, abolitionism, women's suffrage, all of these movements, and, and also some odd 
religious expressions, Shakerism, Mormonism, Seventh-day Adventism, they all originate in the 19th century. And the utopian communities that come out of those, the Oneida community or other, I mean, it, was a little, it was a crazy time in, uh, in places in 19th century America. Mark Twain satirizes a lot of this in his fiction, and you can read about it, and, and so you, when you look at it, it puts things in perspective when you see what's going on, because I don't know about you, but sometimes I just blink and, and say, I'm at a loss. This is just a crazy world we're living in. Like, where has the sanity gone? This came up in earlier talks. Uh, how could anyone possibly believe this? And then somehow I'm the crazy one for questioning it. I, I suspect some of you have felt that way yourselves. And, uh, and what do we see inside that movement is a kind of passionate intensity and wokeism a fervor of commitment, a mission to change the world. Yes, a willingness to sacrifice. The woke are ready to sacrifice. They're ready to make sacrifices on behalf of what they believe in. It's all consuming. It's a mission. And, it's, and, and to some degree, the sacrifice of reason that you see inside wokeism I think to some degree is a, is a badge of honor. Like wokeism does not represent science. Uh, in fact, what we've seen increasingly is a willingness of wokeism to attack science. This is most obvious in the area of gender ideology. Uh, so much data on the profound biological rooted differences between male and female sex in the human species and the attempt to say that sex, biological sex, is uh, culturally created um, or that mutilating a 13-year-old girl, permanently sterilizing her because she got online and, read, and had an eating disorder and other things and, read, and, and encountered different groups that were pressuring her to identify uh, what, what, what is referred to as rapid onset, gender dysphoria. The best thing is to permanently sterilize and mutilate her. That's, that's what standard care should do. It's insane, but it's also not scientifically rooted. It just takes time to figure these things out. Strangely, Europe is figuring out these things faster than the United States. Uh, Britain has ceased all gender-affirming care. They shut down their clinic um, based just on the evidence. The same thing is happening in the Scandinavian countries. America's feeling the heat, but we got, you know, we're capitalists. We got, it's a multi-billion dollar industry, that uh, gender care industry, but it's happening, okay? So there's some hope here. Okay, so um, we, we all see the effects of wokeism in our culture the dismantling of law enforcement, the indoctrination efforts in the corporations and other places, the, the mandatory um, diversity, equity, inclusion, which I think has artfully been described as division, exclusion, indoctrination, DEI. Uh, I like that one. Uh, the, um, and, and the sort of aggressive promotion of sexual autonomy uh, with respect to abortion and so-called gender affirmative care. And finally, just the intolerance. Um, we've seen the, the, the sort of aggressive uh, cancellations, the mobs. I could recite lots of uh, in, episodes of this, but you know them. Most recently, I think we've seen this happen with the, with the attack uh, on Israel. I think it's important to see that if you think of everything in terms of power relations, the, the threats of violence are not a, a bug in wokeism, they're a feature of wokeism. That is where it's going to go, that's where the logic of wokeism goes. So how do we combat it? Um, well, obviously, um, the answer is simple given what I've said, which is to combat it, we have to defend truth. Right? We have to defend reason, we have to defend freedom and the good. We have to defend friendship, and we have to defend the dignity of the person. But I would say 
more than anything else, we have to do is live these out better. Because, because of the religious nature inside the, the Great Awakening, because it's a, a religious, it's animated by this religious impulse, arguments alone by themselves, I think, are not going to do the work. There's got to be something else. And here's one thing that we have in our favor that I happen to think is very, very powerful. And it's this. The woke are very unhappy. Uh, I don't know if you know anyone who's in any of these movements. Uh, I know some. We all have family members, friends, relatives, whatever, that have been infected by this. Um, none of the ones I know are happy people. They're angry, resentful, hurt, anxious, and in fact, a study just came out uh, a week ago. Uh, it was done, uh, another Scandinavian study, comprehensive study done, and it confirmed what I've also experienced, that the self-reported uh, sort of self-satisfaction or happiness of the woke is far lower than the non-woke, okay? So there's an apostolic opportunity here. And I think the apostolic opportunity is that you've got to show joy in your lives. You've got to live the joy. If they don't see the joy, none of the arguments are going to work. Joy before, before argument. So important to exemplify that. Okay, but this is a men's conference, right? So it's not just about how we defend these things, but how do we do it as men? Right? What's the specific man way to do this? Of course, that raises the question, what is a man? And we could say, well, that's, a, that's really easy. That's an adult male human being. Unfortunately, that's not enough, right? Uh, that's not really a man. And maybe just to be a little clearer than I should say gentleman. Like, what is a gentleman? A gentleman is a real man. That's what I'll say here, okay? Gentleman, we're talking about a man in full. And there's this interesting thing. It's very hard to get a gentleman. You know, what is distinct about a gentleman in some sense is, you know, we've got strength, men are strong. But a gentleman has to have strength at the service of reason, strength at the service of freedom, strength at the service of friendship, strength at the service of human dignity. And men are prone, in fact, to two different qualities. We just let them go without formation, and faith, men tend to fall into two categories. They tend to be either wimps or barbarians. Dylan Mulvaney or Andrew Tate. That's the way men naturally tend. And most of the girls I talk to, they're like, where are the men? All I see are like barbaric guys who are really aggressive and disrespectful or wimpy guys. But there's no gentleman. How do we get a gentleman? Well, by gentlemen, by the way, I'm not talking about a, like a fusty English aristocrat with a tweedy coat on. I'm talking about gentlemen in this, this great Greek word that Plato coins, a kalos kaogathos. Literally means beautiful and good. A beautiful and good man, the kalos kaogathos. That's what I'm talking about when I say a gentleman. And here's just a, so a quick benchmark of what a gentleman uh, is. I've got a sign hanging up in my bathroom. Got five boys. So it's help, helpful to put little signs up around the house just to remind them of some things. So the, this sign, I got some of these from this guy, Jonathan Reyes, who recently gave a talk uh, to a focus group. And then I added and changed some things around. On one side of the column, it says what boys want. On the other side of the column is what men want. So. Boys want comfort. Men want a challenge. Boys complain. Men endure. Boys want fun. Men want responsibility. Boys want to be entertained. Men want to act for a mission. Boys want to show off. Men want respect. Boys want buddies, bros. 
Men want friends. Boys ask, what can you do for me? Men ask, what can I do for you? Boys want a mom. Men want a wife. Boys want to give orders. Men want to serve. Boys break things. That's a good one. Men fix things. <laughs> you know this. Or they make things. Boys take what they want. Men protect what they love. Okay, that's just shorthand. Take those qualities and apply them to what I've just been talking about. This, like, what's the manly way to defend reason, freedom, friendship, and human dignity? Just a few pieces of advice here. I think uh, defending reason, defending truth. I think it's very, very important that we be truth seekers. And that means, by the way, seeking the truth all around and not just the truth so that it confirm what we want to believe. I don't think that we defeat wokeism by imitating the woke tactics. So they silo themselves inside the voices that only they want to listen to. I don't think we can afford to silo ourselves inside only the voices that tend to agree with what we say. I know this is like hard. See, I teach St. Thomas Aquinas, and Aquinas, when he does his disputation, if you've ever read Thomas Aquinas, the whole strategy was first, State the view of your opponent as accurately as you can. He was known to do this. Like his opponents would say, you said that better than I could have said it. Until you can say what that person is thinking as they would understand themselves, you're not doing justice to the truth. We, we owe it to the, to, to the truth to do this. I think we owe it to uh, the, the conception of human dignity I'm talking about to be truth seekers. And we can talk more about this during Q&A, but I, I think that the danger is wanting to seize kind of a ring of power to defeat wokeism. And I think going to the other side is not a good strategy. But here's another one. Um, when we say truth seeking, I mean at a deep level, not just at a superficial level. I think I know so many men who feed themselves on popular news rage porn, right? They love the red meat of just hearing how bad the world is. Look at all the stuff that's going wrong. This just feels good in some ways to see how bad it all is. I, I, uh, another sign I have hanging in my house, because I, you know, I admit the temptations here. I hung up a sign from Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Some of you may know it. Pulled it up on my phone this morning. Philippians 4.4. 4. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is beautiful, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. How much time do we take to do that? We can get so myopically focused on how bad everything is around us and forget that. Um, so what are we spending our time on reading and watching and listening to? On freedom, uh, this is what I often say to the young men th that I teach, stop blaming everything. Uh, it's unmanly to blame. It's just an unmanly thing. Oh, it's feminism's fault that I can't find a girlfriend. No, it isn't. Especially not at Hillsdale. You know, you, you don't have a girlfriend here. I don't, I don't know what I can do for you. It just doesn't make sense to me. So stop blaming everything around you for your problems. Man up. 
become an agent. Secondly, though, talk about freedom. I want to say, like, what is your mission? Like, so many failures to launch of young men. Sit in their parents' basement playing video games, whatever, I don't get it, but, but think about your mission, because that's what's going to make you a man, is thinking about your mission. What's the mission God gave you? Okay, here's an easier one, friendship. This is one of the biggest struggles of men, and you're here, so you get this, but we can all work on it. Friendship. Deep need for male friendship. And something about men, they simultaneously kind of resist it and long for it. And the devil uses that uh, to isolate us and make us feel lonely and, and to stop us from that sort of deep need we have for intimate friendship, first with God. If you don't have friendship with God, nothing else is going to come together. And that's in the prayer that Ralph Martin was talking about this morning. Get your prayer life in order. If you're married, friendship with your spouse. That's your first human friendship with your, with your spouse. Are you building your friendship with your spouse? It was mentioned earlier, and I've got a lot of things to say about you know, all of these things, but you know, the single greatest correlation to the sort of pathologies we see in America is marriage or no marriage. Like if, you, if you could do one thing to fix poverty, fix crime, fix unemployment, fix mental health issues and depression, I'm naming all these. Like you could fix one thing, bang for your buck, it's marriage. Marriage is the single greatest, most powerful, and I'm talking about bi intact biological marriage. Children raised by their biological parents. And I think men have a very, very, important role to play in this. And I think that while men are not exclusively responsible for some of the marital problems, I think they bear a lot of the responsibility. That we've just not been men. We've, not, we've allowed ourselves to not be the men that God made us to be and calls us to be. Friendship with your children. Um, I know lots of parents, you know, I heard, I heard it earlier, um, that, you know, that you're not meant to be a friend of your children. I think there's something to that. Leonard Sachs, one of my favorite people uh, who writes on parenting, talks about the just right parent. He, he, he's an he's a MD, PhD, therapist, clinical psychology. He's excellent. He's not Catholic, but he's very good. And he distinguishes between the authoritarian parents and the permissive parents. And both of them err. But then he says there's the just right parent. They know, they're confident in their authority, and we need that. We can't be permissive parents. You gotta be confident in your authority, but you've also gotta be friends. If your kids do not see your genuine love and affection and care for them and joy with them, it's not gonna work. And you know, the, the, this is the heart of it, is what's your mission for your family? I was going to, I was, I guess I'll just quickly tell this story. I, I, I do a lot of um, music with my, my family. I mean, one advantage of having a lot of kids is you can, you, know, you get your sports team or you, you can, you know, make them be your friends, right? So I, I've got my kids to all learn musical instruments and they're my bluegrass backup band. And so uh, I've, I've used them in various occasions and after the pandemic and all the shutdowns that happened, um, right after the shutdowns were over, we went to a local pub and, and did a, a show there. Now, don't get me wrong, we're not professionals, but someone once told me, I'm, I'm the weak link, uh, I'm a guitar player, but my kids refuse to take a banjo, and I thought, what's a bluegrass band without banjo? So I learned that I had no idea how hard it is to play banjo. So I'm kind of the weak banjo playing link in this arrangement. But someone told me, you're never gonna get good playing unless you like just go out in front of people and do it. I'm like, I'm terrified, you just gotta go do it. So, we, so I took my family, we went to a pub, uh, just we, for free, it was like, can we go play? Oh yeah, come on, bring them in. And it was just a very extraordinary moment because it was packed. They said, we've never seen the place so full. And I, my kids were just joyful, they were, they were playing fiddle and guitar and laughing and singing, making mistakes and laughing. 
And I can't tell you how many people came up to me after that and said, this is the most healing moment I've had in the last three years. Like, I forgot that you could just have joy in a family. And that this could be fun, and that we could socialize and have a beer, and, listen, and you're doing something. You're not just sit, sitting around, but you're, you're, you're making something beautiful. And I think in a way that just a microcosm of what we've got to do is, is live the joy of our vocation and witness that. I have no idea how many of those people were you know, woke, sympathetic, liberal, conservative. I don't know and I don't really care. You know, I just wanted them there to share that experience. Friendship with your children and then friendship with other men. Like, we got to cultivate that friendship with other men. And that means, yes, prayer, Bible studies, but other stuff too. Um, play sports together, um, play pickleball, whatever. Um, get out and sort of do some things that develop you and help you to grow. Get a beer, whatever, so you can really kind of hit the range of the gifts that you have and not just a local one. And then of course, respect for persons. That's the last category, right? How do we use our manliness to respect persons? Uh, obviously, when there are physical threats, we put our body in the way. That's a, a vocation, but it's also to defend the forms of reason that are the core of our civilization. We have great movies about this. I encourage you to watch them with your kids. 12 Angry Men. That's almost like a parable of our culture, right? If you've ever seen that movie, it's all in, like, takes place in one room and it's a jury and they're just ready to convict and they're angry. And Henry Fonda plays the one guy who's like, well, I don't really know, I'm not ready to vote yet. What about this and this? And then there, there's explosions of anger and arguments. And, and, but his courage, his little act of courage, like swings the whole thing around and gives him a moment to pause and not just act on passion or anger or prejudice or whatever, but to act for the truth. To kill a mockingbird, and Atticus Finch, what a man. What a man Atticus Finch is. So there's a study done. Um, I'm finishing up here. I, I, I've got an alarm. Okay, 12.33, two minutes. Um, so I won't give you my conclusion, which was models of masculinity in Lord of the Rings. Um, but the last thing is that there was a study done uh, called the Famous Ash Study, 1920s. It's been replicated numerous times in which a group was um, given a very simple task of uh, seeing lines that were equal or unequal on a piece of paper and simply selecting which one was the equal one. And when they did the test, not surprising, 99% of the people chose the equal lines. Okay? But then they planted a bunch of participants into the study who chose the wrong answer. And the next time they ran the study, 35% chose the wrong answer. And then they ran it again, and it went up to 70%. This has been replicated over and over. The people, when they saw what other people were choosing, started changing their answers. Is it because they lost confidence, because they were afraid of the social stigma, afraid of being wrong? I don't know. But then they replicated it again, where several who had selected it, the wrong answer correct the first time, changed their minds and vocalized that, and the numbers plummeted again. That is, when others in the study saw one model sort of say, this is the wrong answer, it changed that contagion of wanting to follow all the wrong answer people. And people got courage from that. And my point is that we need courage in this culture of just being the voice when you think no one else is there, of just firmly but dispassionately stating the truth, speaking the truth. You don't know how much good that does. You don't know how powerful that is. And we need it so much today. We need individuals in these crowds because I'm telling you, there are a lot of other people that think like you do, but they don't have the courage. And you can give them the courage by just speaking the truth there and being a witness to it. 
So I'm out of time. It's 1235. I understand there's going to be a panel maybe in a little bit. Thank you very much. You've been a great audience.